but we're glad you're here. Why don't you take your Bible this morning and open it with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, we're going to look into this book in God's Word. I personally believe the Apostle Paul probably also was the penman of this book. Uh, so that would make him about 13 of the New Testament books. Uh, so look into the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Throughout the year I've been preaching on the thought, God's grace makes the difference. And uh, it does make the difference in our lives. And uh, we're going to look today on grace not to fail the grace of God. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, I want to show it to you from the scripture today. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, we'll read one verse and then we'll look at several of the other verses that we have here. And uh, I'm excited because next Sunday morning I'll begin a new series of messages uh, that we've entitled, The Times Are Changing. And I put a display up here for you. And we're going to be preaching on Bible prophecy between now and the end of the year. And we're looking at, uh, at the thought that we do believe we're living in the last days. You know, in our Sunday school class this morning, I just drew a tri timeline on the board. And we started with creation six to 8,000 years ago. And you know that every 2,000 plus or minus years in human history, a great event takes place. There was creation. 2,000 plus or minus years and the flood. Another 2,000 plus or minus and the cross. Another 2,000 plus or minus and the rapture. And we're at 2018 right now, aren't we? Somewhere in that area. And uh, the Lord could come at any time. We're living in the last days. And uh, we're going to be looking at the last days and beyond and how that, that things are changing. I, I took this clock and uh, the clock works, but you'll notice every hour is 12 o'clock. And we're at that midnight hour, aren't we? Uh, and we're ready for the Lord to come again. And so we're going to begin those series of messages next Sunday morning. And uh, then tonight I'll start a new series as well entitled Real Christian. We've looked at what a real church is. And that's been our theme through the year is being a true New Testament church in the last days. We want to be a biblical New Testament church. And uh, tonight, uh, we're going to look at what it means to be a real Christian. Not, not what the world says a Christian is, but what does God's Word say a Christian is. And so we're going to look at that tonight. So all these things, we're thankful for the Word of God. Hebrews 12, uh, notice verse number 15, if you will. Verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, let's look at this subject today, grace not to fail His grace. Lord, thank You for today. Thank You, Lord, for our building with the Bible hour. Uh, thank You for the students who were in those classes so that we might hear God's Word. And Lord, our lives be built upon biblical foundations. We believe, God, we are the sum of what we believe. And so make us, Lord, to be men and women, families that will have a positive impact in our local church. And our church can be a New Testament church and make a difference in this community. Lord, we pray today that, God, you would speak to every heart in life. And, Lord, if someone's come to church today without Christ, uh, Lord, we pray they would trust you today and be saved. Thank you for our Bible, our, our super church this morning, our children. Uh, Lord, appreciate the bus workers out early this morning, and they'll be the last ones back to the church this afternoon. Thank you for nursery workers and everyone that's serving you today so that the Word of God can go forth. We pray, God, it would not return void as you promised. It'll do its work in all of our hearts and lives. May we be obedient to you, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. You know, we know today... As we begin to look at the Word of God about the subject of grace, that God's grace will never fail you. God's grace will never fail you. God is the God of all grace. The Bible said He's the God of all grace. And the Bible tells us His grace is sufficient for all things in our life. And so the grace of God will never fail. But I want you to understand today that, that we can fail, we can fail, the grace of God by not allowing it to do its work to its fullest in our lives. We can fail the grace of God. 
You say, well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, you know, we can fail the grace of God by just simply not growing spiritually in our lives. Uh, We're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if we get saved by the grace of God, we're born again, and uh, we're never going to see hell, not even for a moment, and we have eternal life, but we fail to grow and mature spiritually, then we're failing in the grace of God in that matter because we've failed to grow. We've, we've stayed as we were when we could have become so much more effective for the Lord in this lifetime. We fail the grace of God by refusing to yield to the work of the Spirit of God within. God, through His grace, Uh, through the Word of God, through the circumstances, situations of life. He wants us to grow, and the Spirit of God will guide us and help us and lead us. But if we don't yield to that leadership and guidance, then we're really failing in that area of God and the grace of God. Uh, We fail uh, when we do not allow the grace of God to be our source of strength, when we allow the things of the world to overcome us, to to get on top of us and, and to put us down or to turn us back. We're failing of the grace of God. You know, our text here today, uh, this book of Hebrews, by its very title, was written to Jewish born-again believers, and they were, they were the recipients of this letter. They were Jews who had left the religious system of the Jews and had rested in the finished work of Jesus Christ. They had been born again. They, they had uh, trusted Christ by the grace of God for uh, their salvation. But there was a constant, continual pull upon them. Uh, They were being pulled back into practicing the Jewish rituals and religious activities to secure their salvation. Other Jews who who did not like them trusting Christ and accepting Jesus Christ and departing from the Jewish religion, they were constantly uh, hounding them and and, and teaching them that they needed to, uh, to well, it's all right to have a little bit of this Jesus, but don't, don't leave uh, take, making the sacrifices, and don't leave observing the feasts, and don't, don't leave doing these things. And they were trying to add uh, this yoke again upon them, a bondage. But we know today that the grace gift of the Son, Jesus Christ, is enough to secure the forgiveness of sin and eternal life to everyone that we believe. That we don't need anything else but Jesus Christ, that He alone is salvation. And they were trying to be, uh, they were trying to add to that, uh, that, that finished work of Christ. And we know that we can and must rest in Jesus Christ. We must learn to grow in and not fail the grace of God that's available for our lives. And I want you to look at these simple thoughts this morning. Write down number one, don't fail the grace to forgive. Don't fail in the grace to forgive. In verse 14, the, the, the uh, penman here, led of the Spirit of God, he writes, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow, follow peace with all men. You know, grace and forgiveness go hand in hand. And it is by God's grace that we can be forgiven. It's by the grace of God there's the opportunity of forgiveness. We don't deserve to be forgiven, but grace isn't about what we deserve. Grace is, is getting what we don't deserve. Grace is, uh, is the unmerited favor of God. And so grace and forgiveness go hand in hand. And we must never forget that it is by grace that we've been saved from our sin debt. That it is by the grace of God that we are forgiven. uh, And we did not deserve that forgiveness. We did not deserve eternal life. And here we're instructed as the people of God to follow peace. We are to pursue peace within. And we are to pursue peace with others. We're to live... uh, close to the Lord, right with God, obedient to the Scriptures, so that we are experiencing the peace of God in our hearts and lives. But we're also to pursue living in peace with those without. And uh, the Bible says we're to pursue peace. You know, we, we can have and know peace within when we're born again by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. You may be here tonight or this morning in your life, there's no peace in your life. 
many people are living that way today. They're pursuing uh, the things of the world. They're pursuing position. They're pursuing provisions. They're pursuing power. They're pursuing pleasure. And they're getting it and they're gaining it and they're experiencing it only to find out that it hasn't brought to them what they're looking for. And they're looking for more or looking for something else. And many people today, we see it reflected in their lives. They're moving from one job to another, one relationship to another relationship. They're looking, they're seeking, they're searching for something to satisfy, to establish them, to give them a foundation, uh, to let them know that there's meaning and purpose in life. And, uh, and they're not finding it. And they'll never will find it until they look to Jesus Christ. But by His grace in Christ, we know that we can find peace. Peace. And there's no peace with God except through Jesus Christ. And God God forgave our sin for His Son, Jesus Christ's sake. You know, we can't forget that. Even though we're born again today by the grace of God, we pass from death unto life. Our sin debt has been forgiven. It wasn't anything about you that caused God to forgive your sin. It wasn't the kind of prayer you prayed. It wasn't how much you cried or didn't cry. It wasn't how drastically you turned from the things of the world to spiritual things. It wasn't any of those reasons why God forgave your sin. It's only one reason, and that is His Son. The perfect, sinless Son of God suffered on the cross was forsaken by the Father while becoming our sin and gave His life as the sacrifice, was buried and rose again. That's the only reason we're saved and forgiven today. It's all because of Christ's sake. It's not anything that has to do with you and I. And we can't forget that. It's by the grace of God that we've been forgiven. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know, we're, we're to allow the grace of God which we have access to through faith in Jesus Christ to enable us to forgive others as we have been forgiven. Now I know this is, this is an area that's difficult for us. You know, one of our Building with the Bible, our classes this semester or this September is how to overcome bitterness biblically and scripturally because this is a, this is a problem that we all struggle with. And, uh, and, and, and we are to, we're to, we're to receive the grace that God has provided for us by faith in Christ that will enable us to pursue peace with men and to overcome bitterness and to forgive. And We fail so many times the grace of God when we allow bitterness and resentment to grow and have a place in our hearts. In Romans 14, verse 19, the Bible said, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. There's no place in the heart and life of a child of God for bitterness. There's no place there for an unforgiving spirit. And there's no place for it because of the grace of God. Because we have been forgiven by the grace of God. Because we are the recipients of the grace of God. Because we have the grace of God within our hearts and lives. There's no place in our lives for these things. Bitterness and hatred tear down. They destroy lives. They they destroy the lives of others. They destroy our own lives from within. In verse number 15 The Bible said, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Bitterness, having an unforgiving spirit, an ungracious spirit. The Bible said it defiles who we are to be as a child of God. You know, the word defile means to stain. It means to smear as with mud or filth. It means to take something that ought to be one way and make it something else. Something dirty, something stained, something marred. And, and we're, we're, to, uh, we're to be undefiled by bitterness and an unforgiving spirit. We're to look diligently, the Bible said, into our own lives and allow God to show us in our lives sometimes the things we ourselves don't even realize. 
Sometimes we don't realize those roots of bitterness, those things that, 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 uh, that we've not been able to get over or get beyond. And sometimes like a root that you really can't see, uh, you don't find it in the yard till you stumble over it, till you fall over it. But those are those things in our life that sometimes we don't even realize that they're there, that they cause us to stumble. They keep us from moving forward in our spiritual relationship with the Lord and being used of God. And we stumble over those things. Or someone, there's someone that, uh, that we just can't get past what they did, what they said, or what the, we think they should have done or said. And we stumble, we fall, and we won't forgive. And we often keep, we keep those things under the surface of our hearts and minds. And many times we're unwilling to confront them and see them as God sees them or see the damage that they do. You know, we must bring those things to the Lord. He said to look for them diligently. Bring them to the Lord. Confess them and allow the grace of God, the same grace that forgave us. The same grace that that enabled, uh, that was enabling uh, us to be forgiven for Christ's sake. And we must allow that grace in our own hearts and lives to enable us to forgive and move forward in our spiritual lives. We must allow God's grace to build our lives so that we can build in our life and the lives of others. So sometimes we fail. Sometimes we fail. We must not fail the grace of God in forgiveness. But notice another thing, number two, don't fail the grace to stay focused. Notice verse number 18, for ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and a tempest. Now, we believe most likely the Apostle Paul, Paul is the penman, and he's reminding these Jewish people about some things in their past, their history. They prided themselves in their history, didn't they? Their culture. That they were the children of Abraham and all these things. And so he's using that here to help them. Uh, he's pointing them back, these Jews, to Mount Sinai. You remember that's where God gave the law. That's when the Jewish people, Israel, chose the law rather than grace. We would have the law. And so... Moses went up on the mountain. God gave him the law. That mountain, that mountain was clothed in darkness and blackness and thundering and lightning. And, and no one could even dare approach that mountain without death coming upon them. And, and God is saying here, He's pointing them back to Sinai. He, he says, this is, remember, this is where God gave the law. Remember that that is where with the law, there was no mercy. There was no grace. There was judgment. There was death when the law was transgressed. He, said, he says, don't, don't, don't go back there. For ye are not come unto that mount. That's not where you are. That's not where you are now in your spiritual life. He wants them to look to Calvary. Not Mount Sinai. Look to Mount Calvary. To what has been done there for you by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. That's where there's mercy. That's where there's grace. That's where there's forgiveness. For all whoever uh, they may be, whatever they may have done, there's grace, grace and mercy and forgiveness there in the Lord. And you know, that's what He wanted them to focus on. And that's what our lifelong focus must be. We must never, never forget the cross work of Jesus Christ. We must stay focused on it. Focusing on who He is and what He did for us because it will strengthen us. And it will be the source of spiritual success in our lives. Verse number 2 of Hebrews 12, if you go back up to the very first part, he says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him. Consider Him. Paul's challenging every believer, don't just, don't just have a casual knowledge that Jesus went to the cross for you. Consider who He was there and consider what He did for you and consider what it means to your life right now. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. God is focusing our attention uh, there to Calvary. 
Calvary, where there's grace, where there's mercy, where there's forgiveness. And then God focuses our attention ahead. He note, notice in verse number 22, he says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than of Abel. See, we're on a journey through this world to that heavenly city, if you know the Lord is your personal Savior. We're just moving through this world. We're headed to that place where we'll stand before our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying here, listen, by the grace of God, you've been saved through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And it'll be the grace of God that carries you through. It'll be the grace that gets you into that eternal heavenly city. It'll be the grace of God that you can stand there at the judgment seat of God. And by His grace, if we obey the Lord, if we walk near the Lord, someday we can hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But it'll be all by the grace of God. Never forget. Focus on that. Don't forget that. Uh, remember that we're moving toward uh, where He is. We're going to be there someday. And may the Lord help us by His grace to arrive there unashamed. Unashamed. We have a little chorus in the back of the booklet. We've had it in there for several months and we've not sang it as much as I want to. Let the Lord have His way. And uh, we're going to sing it some more, but we're going to change it. And beginning this month now and for the next couple months, we're going to put a new chorus in the booklet. And it's called, Therefore the Redeemed. And it's a scriptural little chorus. It's taken literally from Isaiah 51, verse 11. It says, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain joy, uh, or gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. And we've got the piano music to that. We're going to play it for you. We're going to help you all to learn how to sing it. But think about that. We're on a journey through this world to a heavenly city. And, and it will be by keeping our focus on Mount Calvary that we'll arrive there unashamed, running the race well, finishing well, which is what he spoke about in Hebrews 12, verse number 1. In Revelation 3, verse 12, the Bible said, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. By the grace of God, knowing we are forgiven, focused on the cross work of Christ, we can overcome. We can overcome right now the world, the flesh, and the devil by the grace of God because of what we have in Jesus Christ. Revelation 21 says, I, John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Heaven. Heaven will be great, but, but it's Jesus Christ that will be the glory of that place. Isn't it? And we will see Him, and we're going to stand before Him. Sometimes you've sang the song, or we've sang the song, Heaven for me. Heaven for me. It says, I've heard of a land that is wondrously fair. They say that its splendor is far beyond compare. In that place that's called heaven, my soul longs to be. For where Jesus is, it will be heaven for me. Heaven for me, heaven for me. Jesus will be what makes it heaven for me. All its beauty and wonders I'm longing to see. But Jesus will be what makes it heaven for me. Verse 24 in our text there in Hebrews 12, it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. I'm thankful for that new covenant, aren't you? By the blood and finished work of Christ, by the grace of God, we can be forgiven of our sins. We can be insured a home in heaven. 
don't, don't fail the grace of God in the matter of forgiving. Don't let bitterness, hatred, resentment, don't let these things get a hold in your life because they'll, they'll, they'll cause you to stumble. They'll cause you to fall. They'll, they'll, they'll cause you to fail of the grace of God which is able to give you forgiveness and able to get you over and beyond and move forward in your life so that as we focus on the Lord and may the grace of God help us not to fail the grace of God by getting our eyes off of what the finished work of Christ means. It means we have a home in heaven. It means that as we run the race, we can, we can overcome. We can overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. We can arrive there someday, see our Savior, stand before Him, and not be ashamed to be in His presence. And then number three, don't fail by grace to fear God. Don't fail to fear Him. See in your text in Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 25, see that you refuse not Him that speaketh. For if they escape not, who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. You know, by the grace of God, we should fear God. You say, Pastor, I, I don't know if grace and fear are comparable things. But, but notice, please, in our text, in our text in verse 28, whereby, he says, he says, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Don't fail by grace to fear God. Don't fail the grace of God not to forgive don't fail the grace of God not to keep focused on the cross work of Jesus Christ. But don't fail by or because of God's grace not to fear Him. You know, by His grace, God is speaking today. Today. I believe every time we open up the Word of God, we read it, we look at it, we hear it taught, preached by the anointing of the Spirit of God, God is speaking. God is speaking from heaven. He's speaking to you today. When you come to church, I hope you come to church expecting to hear from God because God speaks through His Word. He speaks to help us. He speaks to bring peace to our hearts and lives. Don't fail that grace, the grace of God speaking to you by refusing to listen to His Word. Our text says in verse 25, See that you refuse not Him that speaketh. Don't refuse Him. Don't fail by the grace of God, not to live in holy fear of God. The word fear in our Bibles here, it means to recognize and respect who God is. It means to surrender to His Word, to yield to His will and Spirit, to live your life as He is worthy of. Psalm 89, verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about Him. John Newton in his great hymn, Amazing Grace, you remember what he said? "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, to fear." When God convicts us of sin, shortcomings, areas where we fail to surrender and yield our lives, it's by His grace that He has spoken to you and shown you those things. He didn't have to. He could have just exercised divine judgment. He didn't have to speak to you about that. He didn't have to challenge you, show you where you're falling short and rebuke you and correct you. But by grace, He does. He speaks by His Word. 
He shows us where we fail. He shows us where we've fallen. He shows us when we're falling afar off. He says, come to me. He wants us to come to him. He'll forgive us of our sin. If any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father. If we'll confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us by his grace. But don't let the fact that he is gracious cause you to fail to fear him because he's to be greatly feared. He is to be greatly feared. We must not fail His grace by ignoring Him, by continuing on without change, by rebelling against Him. When He speaks to us, we need to speak. When He speaks of surrender, we should surrender. When He speaks about yielding, we should yield. When He speaks about sin and convicts us of it, we need to forsake it and confess it. We must not fail to fear Him and hear Him. The word hear means to give heed to. It means to obey. See, God is alive. God's speaking to you. God's speaking to you right now. There's some of you here this morning. God's speaking to you about trusting Him and and confessing sin and, and, and just receiving the grace of God to be born again through the finished work of Christ. Some of you here today, you're trusting religious traditions and rituals. The fact that maybe you were baptized as an infant or learn the catechism, or maybe uh, you were confirmed, and some of you are, are trusting some things plus Jesus, just enough of Jesus thrown in. But the Bible said there's no way into heaven or no forgiveness and eternal life but Jesus Christ alone. God's speaking to some of you today about being born again, about being saved, that you're on your way to a Christless eternity. If you died today, you're not going into that heavenly city. You're going to be forever separated from Him. Listen, don't, don't, let, don't, don't fail here in the grace of God. God's graciously speaking to you today, showing you today that there's salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ, that you can be saved today. Don't walk out of here today and fail the grace of God. Don't fail to fear Him as He speaks to you. And for us that know Him as our Savior, God's speaking to us. He's speaking to us about our lives. He wants us to grow, to be more like Him. To grow in grace and knowledge of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's areas we need to yield. Places we need to surrender. Places that that we won't let Him get in. uh, Things we need uh, to allow Him to have control of in our lives. And things we need to put out. Things we need to bring in. Don't let the fact that He's a God of grace cause you not to fear Him. We should fear Fear Him. God, by His grace, has given us His Son. He speaks through His Word. God speaks through His Word. By His grace, He speaks through the situations and circumstances of life. Sometimes the things you're involved in and going on around you, God is speaking to you to try to get you to ask the question, Why, Lord? Is there something you want me to see in this? And God will speak. Verse 28, he says in our text, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Don't fail the grace of God by not serving Him with all you are and have. Serving Him acceptably. There's an unscriptural view of grace that, that many people, many people have, have made their doctrine. It's, it's, a, it's an unscriptural view of the grace of God that says a born-again believer can do whatever they please to do or don't do whatever they don't want to do. Because it's grace. It's all grace. They can choose not to go to church at all or they can choose to go to the wrong one. God's gracious. They can choose... To spend time in the Bible and heed the Word of God or not. Or they can choose any version of it that they want. You know, they can, they, they, they feel that they can give, tithe, give offerings if they want to. And if they don't want to, they don't have to because it's grace. They can live a separated life or not, serve the Lord or not. You know, the Bible said we're to grow in the grace of God. And the grace of God, it says here, let us have grace 
whereby we may serve God acceptably. Serve Him acceptably. I don't know about you, but anything that grows means there's more of it than there was before. Isn't that how it is? All I have to do is look at my waistline and it's growing, isn't it? There's more there than there was before. And all I have to do is look at my head and it's not growing and there's less hair there than there was before. That's the difference, see? Growing means more. Means more. Listen, growing by the, in the grace of God means more church, not less. It means the right church, not the culturally acceptable church. It means, it means more of God's Word, not less. It means more giving, not less. More separation from the world, not less. More serving, not less. That's what growing is. Growing in the grace of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says in verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. God's grace will not fail. It is bigger, deeper, higher, longer than any problem we have. It will overcome all things. It is all sufficient. It, 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 it is beyond our capability to exhaust the grace of God. There will always be enough. It will never fail. But we can fail the grace of God because we won't allow it to do its work in our life. Live in the light of the reality of the presence of the Lord in your life. You're born again and saved today. He lives in you. He lives in you. He's present with you for whatever the needs of your heart and life are. Look at the cross. Remember it was by grace for His sake that we were forgiven, that we have eternal life. Forgive and go on. Forgive and go on. I promise you, no one's ever done anything to you or someone you love like we're guilty of doing to the Lord Jesus Christ. I put him to death. It was my sin. He died for me. He died. If there had been no one else on planet Earth, he'd have still had to suffer and die just like he did because my sin is that 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 serious, that great. Just forgive. Go on. Let the Lord help you to grow. Serve Him. And then know someday by His grace we're going to see Him. We're going to see Him face to face. Don't fail. Don't fail the grace of God because it's, it's sufficient for our hearts and lives. We're going to bow our heads. We're going to close our eyes. We're going to pray together today. In a moment we're going to stand. We'll have a verse of an invitation song. But with heads bowed and eyes closed, there could be someone today who's come to church, but you've never come to Jesus Christ. Listen, I want you to know today, and I'm the pastor, and there's other pastors and preachers in this building, they'll tell you, coming to church won't ever get a single person into heaven. There are going to be a lot of people leave the pews of churches and step out into a lost eternity. You must receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And it has to begin by confessing your sin. We're sinners. We're sinners. Well, you say, Pastor, I, I told a little lie one time, or I did this, or I did that. No, those are just the symptoms of the problem. We're sinners. And our sin separates us from God. And Jesus Christ is the only way to have our sin debt forgiven and paid for so that it doesn't, doesn't get in the way. He removes it. He removes it by His Son, through His Son, by His Son's sake, by His perfect life and His sacrificial death through His powerful resurrection. You can have eternal life. Maybe you're here today, you've come to church, but you've never received Christ as your personal Savior. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to invite you right now. Why don't you slip out of your seat? What are you waiting for? Why don't you come right now and let us meet you with a Bible show you from the Word of God how to trust Christ, how to have peace, how to know peace. The problem with some people are, the problem with many people are, is they just love their sin. They love it. They love doing what they want to do, when they want to do it, or not doing what they don't want to do. They love all the things of the world, 
problem with that is all the things of the world, they're headed for it. They're headed for destruction. The world and all the things that are in the world, they're all going to perish. But the souls of men are eternal. And they're going to slip out into eternity, either with or without Christ. You're here today without the Lord. We want to invite you to Him today. Maybe you're here, you've come to church, and you'd just you'd say, Pastor, I'd be interested in talking to you after the service about being saved. I'd like to meet with you after church. I'll, I'll wait for you. If you'll just slip your hand up and show me by that, I'd like to talk to someone after church about being saved. I'll be looking for you. I won't embarrass you. I'll just come and say, hey, let's sit down and let's settle this. Someone today, just slip your hand up right back down. Let me just see it. Lord, speaking to hearts today, speaking to you. What's he speaking to you about as a child of God? By his grace, he's speaking to you about your life, where you are as a born-again believer. Are you growing? Is there more and more of the things of God in your life or less and less? If he speaks, he's gracious. And when he speaks, we ought to fear him and we ought to obey him and yield ourselves to his word, surrender our hearts and life to him. Maybe the Lord's laid something on your heart. You just want to come today and say, Lord, thank you for being gracious to me. And maybe you just need to come and, and just say, Lord, uh, whatever this is you're dealing with me about, God, I just want, I want by your grace to be obedient. I want you to lead me, to guide me. Maybe you're here today and, and the Lord's speaking to your heart about just getting focused again on the cross. Maybe someone that, 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 that you've, failed to forgive something in your life you can't get over whatever it is won't you come today let the grace of God be all sufficient in your heart and life Lord we thank you for your goodness we thank you for your grace it makes all the difference so Lord today may we be obedient people to you and Lord if someone here needs to trust Christ and be saved we pray they will for your glory and Lord for we that know you as our Savior we pray we'll be obedient people to you we ask it in Jesus name Amen we're going to stand together and we're going to turn to hymn 310. We're going to sing the first verse of that, hymn number 310. And uh, let's sing that together. First, verse 1 of hymn number 310, and we just be obedient to the Lord. <clears throat> second verse. Amen. Well, we do appreciate the message today and, and uh, just thankful for these truths about God's grace. And, and uh, I'm thankful in our, in our Sunday school class in the ministry center, we were looking at the same passage of Scripture. And I'm thankful uh, for all these truths that we've heard today and how all the, they just all uh, work together and uh, just remind us of some of these wonderful things. And so uh, I'm praying the Lord will help me now. As I've looked at this passage twice today, uh, the Lord will help me to uh, just to learn from these things and grow. And I hope that's your prayer as well. But uh, we're thankful for the day, for this morning, and uh, we're looking forward to being back tonight. Hope you'll be back and uh, be in your place. Remember, orchestra, 5 o'clock, we'll have practice, and then the whole choir at uh, 5.15. So don't miss out on that, and we are excited about it. And, uh, but we'll have a word of prayer. We'll be finished today, uh, this morning, and we'll look forward to being back tonight at 6 o'clock. John Marcel, will you pray for us, please?
Amen.
Cole Dixie and Mike Haley help us. Oh, yeah, she will. Thank you. 